So I just have to have, we'll be on, I'll be on here twice. Two of me, to, to see me twice is to love me more. Exactly. All right. Welcome everybody to the Wednesday class that shall not be named. I am your host, Robert Haas, uh, here twice because uh, that was the one request that people have been asking for years is why can't there be two of me? And so now there is. So I think we're going to have a lot of problems with people. Uh, I'm going to have to send out a new link again. I apologize for those people who couldn't get on. Uh, somehow the uh, you, Zoom link to the, has disappeared completely, including the five-year history of this class. And so I don't know what happened. Probably we, we applied for a second line on our Zoom. And what probably happened is that one got sent there, but I have no information on that or any um, code passwords or anything. So we're going to go here. If you Jason able will to fix it us, up. Huh? Jason will fix Jason it up. Jason will fix it up. I just, yeah, he'll get it figured out. I just, uh, the reason why is we had my, my speakers were blown in my computer. So I was looking for computer speakers. By the time I checked into this class, I didn't realize all the mistakes. So, so welcome everybody. We're going to have a lot of fun today speaking about one of the most important Jews of the 19, of the 19th century, he did live into the 20th century. The effects of what he did are probably more important in the 20th century. And But we'll let a couple more people come in. I saw Larry came in for a second. I hope I didn't kick him out on accident. And I see Michael's coming. I'm so welcome, here. everybody, again. Some technological issues. Okay, I think my speakers got blown somehow. Let's see if I can get Michael on. There we go. Larry's coming on. Oh, there's, there's Larry. Hey, Larry, Hi, Larry. Sorry, we've had some technical issues this morning. <laughs> Mostly because Lou's been playing around again. My As, fault. You know what? You said you retired as a hacker, and we took you at your word. <laughs> exactly. Rabbi, we're going to have to uh, go offline at uh, 20 to 12. Okay. We'll be finished by then. So what we're going to talk about today is... Of course, Theodore Herzl. I'm on my laptop because I have other issues with my computer. Theodore Herzl is, of course, one of the most famous Jews of the 20th century, even though he only lived four years into the 20th century. Uh, he is very famous for what he did over a period of eight or nine years. And um, let's see here. Let's see here. Michael Ann. And we're going to talk a little bit about this unique character in history um, and what he did to transform the world as we know it, especially the Jewish world. So I think we've all heard the name Theodor Herzl. He's considered obviously the father of modern Zionism. He didn't create the word Zionism. That was created a few years earlier by a man named, a man named Nathan Birnbaum. But he took Zionism to a different level, made it an actuality, a probability, a possibility. He created a world in which a Jewish state was foremost in the minds of a lot of people. And when the situation in the world changed over time, became even more viable until eventually there was a Jewish state. I think one of my favorite quotes is in 1898, he said something akin to, in 50 years, we will have a Jewish state. And certainly enough, almost exactly 50 years later, they had a Jewish state. Michael's still having trouble coming in. You see what the problem is here. Let me call Michael and see what's going on. There's there Michael. Is. All right. Sorry, Mike, we had some technical problems today. Um, more two, two different ones. So I was working on one. I didn't know about the other one. So we're talking about Theodore Herzl, who said in 1898 and 50 years, there will be a, a Jewish state. Remember, in the 19th century, we have to take a little step back in that the 19th century was a century of hope in many respects. Nationalism was very popular. 
You saw a struggle between dictatorships and democracies in Europe. And the democratic ideals were starting to take hold and take over countries one at a time. You saw this idea of Judaism having an opportunity to exist in cohesion with the rest of the population. Obviously, there were some very traumatic moments in the 20th century, in the 19th century, not like the 20th century. But there was a general sense in Europe that Jews could start to assimilate. And with this nationalism, the best way to assimilate was to simply say, I am, I'm French, I'm an American, I'm Austrian, I'm German, I'm English, and I'm a Jew. And so you saw a lot of Jews fit into this uh, amalgamation of assimilation in a variety of ways. And what we see is one such person who only lived to age 44, younger than all of us, saw something that scared him and led him down a completely different path. So Theodor Herzl, um, his family moved to, you know, they, they changed their name to be more in line with the names that you have to have. Um, they eventually found their way to Vienna. They are a neologue Jewish family, as we see all over the place, you know, a Jewish family that was ready to assimilate. They're living in, in Hungary, um, eventually, which is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is the center of the world, along with France, in terms of learning. You think of Marx, you think of Picasso, you think of who else do you think of? Freud, you think of, give me some other ones. Einstein. Einstein. Chagall. Chagall. I mean, all of these great Jewish thinkers, but non-Jewish thinkers. A lot of them happen to be Jews, as we know, but not all of them. Most of them weren't, but they're all living in this coffee shop atmosphere of technology and science. What and year was he in Hungary? What year was he in Hungary? About what year we with the family in Hungary? Let me turn this up. Uh, he was in Hungary most of his life. I think they moved. I don't remember when they moved to Hungary, but I think he was young when they moved to Hungary. Let me see. I forgot exactly when his, um, I mean, his family had been in, in that area since the early uh, to mid 18th century. But when did they move to in 1878? No, no, that's when his sister died. I think they, he may have been, was he born there? Was he born in Vienna? Let's see here. Um, he was born in Hungary. Yeah, he was born in Hungary. Eventually, that's, so he was born in Hungary. I think we've all seen the house, the <laughs> building where he was born. It's become a very famous place because it was right next to the very famous synagogue, the biggest synagogue in Europe. His building where he was born and raised was right next to the, the giant synagogue. And it's now become part of that synagogue in no small part because of him, although that may not have been the reason it's bought. It's now part of the synagogue. And so, of course, it's the famous Doheny Street Synagogue. I think many people have been there. But it's just ironic that his building was the apartment complex right next to this famous synagogue. So he is raised in Pest or Bud of Budapest. Uh, part of Hungary. He's in this family that considers himself part of the modern culture. His father is a, a very prominent businessman. Dreyfus wants to, I mean, sorry, uh, Herzl wants to be a scientist. He doesn't really have that scientific ability, apparently. And so he decides to do something else. And that, of course, is to go into the paper business, the newspaper business, to be a writer. He is, of course, living in a time with some very famous writers who were Jewish. Israel Zangwell was, of course, a very uh, uh, proponent of his. But we all know there were so many Jewish writers at this time that were very famous inside the Jewish world and outside the Jewish world. Almost Alon, who was 
uh, also very famous and a very big supporter of his. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that relationship, maybe. So he's living in this world where he is part of the Jewish German elite. You know, he's a germophile. He is, you know, the Germans are the cultured people of the world, as are the French. Technology, philosophy is going to end anti-Semitism. This is the, the world where they live, which we know these ideals are, are, are really taken and what's the word we, and, and transformed as something evil in the 20th century. But in the 19th century, there's still some, of, now there's still some, of course, anti-Semites out there. And there's definitely a fight between them, but just the fact that there's so many Jews who are doing well and thriving, and there is support to fight anti-Semitism is a very nice time to be Jewish in many ways. And so um, when he can't go into science, he starts, of course, reading literature, Shakespeare, all these great, and, and he believed that through all of these enterprises being part of the German world that Judaism could really transform itself in the minds of non-Jews. You know, Jews saw, I mean, Jews were seen as different, as orthodox, as shameless. They had this terrible reputation uh, we knew not deserved, obviously, and he felt like that could change through this nationalism, and he was 100% into it. You know, he was a Jew who got to go to the University of Vienna and Salzburg. I mean, this is a prom. These are prominent universities and he's Jewish and he's not hiding it. He's not religious, but he's not hiding. He's Jewish. And yet he gets to go to these. He's, and so he writes some books. He starts to work for a newspaper in Paris. I would tell you the name, but I'm 100 percent sure I'm going to mispronounce it because I don't speak French. You know, he's. He's, you know, he's writing about the life of people living during this period. You know, he writes some plays, minor success, more success as a newspaper writer. So he is a correspondent. And now there's some debate more recently about what happens and changes him. But the prevailing view is obviously he is um, a correspondent for the Dreyfus Affair. And for those of you who have forgotten who Dreyfus was, Alfred Dreyfus was just like Theodore Herzl, which is irony that these are the two men that really knock over the first domino because they're very integrated, very assimilated. They're germophiles. They are Jews, but they are not religious. And Dreyfus is a French captain who is um, falsely convicted of being a spy. A lot of people, including Herzl, thought he was guilty. So it wasn't the guilt that upset people, although we're going to find later that he, he obviously wasn't soon afterwards and then. But it was the people who were chanting death to the Jews. And he saw this all over the place, death to the Jews, not in, an, in a looping Dreyfus as a Jew, as all Jews are traitors. Now, this is what really set him on a different path, because obviously he's, he has a very, uh, he has a, he's like a 20 year old. He sees, he's not that young at the time, obviously, but he sees the world in perfect idealistic way, and it's crushed by this rant. Rabbi, you're frozen. Am I frozen? Mm -hmm. Put a sweater on. All right, how am I doing now? <laughs> well, your picture's frozen. We can still hear you. Internet. Can you still hear me? Yeah. No, your voice got a little clear. Now you're back. Thawed out. <laughs> what I can do is this. I can put my face with the voice here, and that'll probably do better. Let's see if this works. That'll probably keep it about my face oh, here. So you'll see my face and you'll see my, and then you'll see that my face and what I'm saying doesn't match. So now you can see me, yeah, there you but are. I'm not you're actually, okay so now. I'm going to be a little off in what I'm speaking. Can you see that now? No, you're yeah. good now. You're good. Okay. All right. 
So you see me twice, you should be seeing me twice, once. Picture All right, so it should be just a little off on my mouth because I have uh, my face on one screen and my uh, voice coming from another. All right, so, so he hear, is- Can you I, hear us? Oh yeah, perfectly. Because it's, so, muted, on, it's muted on your screen. It doesn't it's muted mind. on one screen, but on the other screen, I'm, I'm oh, on, yeah. my voice is on the screen where you don't see my face. Okay, my gotcha. face is on the screen. I'm super technologically savvy, just like Lou. So that's why no, I can do things like You're good now. This. Everything's together. You're good now. Okay. So there's a debate to this day as to whether the Dreyfus affair really affected him as much as he said. A lot of people think it didn't, that there were other things that really affected him. Uh, there was a man named Carl Luger in Vienna, who was the mayor, who was very prominent and by all uh, beliefs did an excellent job, but he was very much an anti-Semite. And that certainly could have an effect on him. There were others, but he himself says it was the Dreyfus affair, but that may have been what he said. There's still debates as to what led him down this line, but he saw this and he took this nationalistic, nationalistic viewpoint and said, I, I think we need to do something about this. Um, he believed then very quickly, I mean, he's a young man and his viewpoint changes very quickly. He goes from this ultra nationalistic German, you know, assimilation viewpoint to a, we need our own separate place. And this happens within a year. And so he debates with himself. He starts writing pamphlets about a Jewish state. And obviously it does affect his career because obviously the various newspaper, newspapers don't want somebody writing about the Jewish state because that is not something that's going to sell. So he starts writing it, eventually publishes a book, Dear Judenstadt, which is the state of the Jews in 1896. And it was a big seller for many reasons. One, a lot of people hated it and thought it was terrible because Jews, they still had this other point of view. Jews are nationalistic. I'm French. I'm American. I'm uh, German. I'm British uh, and a Jew. We don't need to be separated from the rest of the world. We need to be integrated. That was especially the belief in America. Although there were some very ardent Zionist supporters, as we know, uh, Brandeis, Judge Brandeis was one of them. Then you had the Orthodox, obviously, who said what? What did the Orthodox say? Jews cannot move to Israel and start a Jewish state until the Messiah, Messiah. comes. They were very anti uh, him. But then you had a lot of people who were showing support. And one of the shocks to him was it wasn't coming from mostly the Austro and the Austro Hungarian Empire, wasn't coming from France or Britain. It was coming from Eastern Europe, where the anti-Semitism was much more overt, where you had seen some terrible anti-Semitic crimes, the killing of the Tsar leading to all the persecution in 1881. There were various times where there were Jews who were uh, killed in, 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 in mass, mass, mass killings of Jews. And so it was not a lot because most of it was, but that did happen. And so he decided he would spend the rest of his life, which as we know, was only a few more years, uh, dedicating himself to a Jewish homeland. And, you know, it was an incredibly, you know, you got to imagine what his friends and family thought for this 100% turn in his life. I mean, he's basically giving up his career. Obviously, he had to find other people who were Zionist themselves. And quite frankly, there were Zionists, but it wasn't a massive organization. There were different Zionist groups. It was not well thought of. You know, there were a few people, you know, there had been attempts to live in Israel. There had been attempts, but really it was not what you would call something the elite would profess to. It would be almost like destroying my career. You know, if I'm prominent, why would I promote the state of Israel when I, my Jews are doing, I'm doing so well in my country as a Jew. So 
he goes around trying to promote this idea and he realizes that in order to do so he's got to do a lot of different things one he's got to get some press you know he's got to make some connections so he uses some of his connections to visit with some very major people uh, i'll also add that um you know he would he would have to do things that a lot of people wouldn't want him to do for instance meeting with the sultan when when we you know when he had also been a very big proponent of the ottoman empire admitting the genocide they did to the armenians in the 1890s so so he visits with a a a, a, a minister friend of him who gets them connected to Frederick I, who is a, a, a grand duke. And eventually he, through this connection, will eventually meet with Wilhelm II, who is, of course, the German emperor. And just that in itself gives him a lot of press. I mean, he's meeting with this man. He'll meet with him again twice in Israel. So just meeting, just getting an audience with the emperor in itself as a Jew is a very big deal. And he did. And so this gives him more confidence. He will try and meet with the, uh, the different leaders, including the sultan. Um, and, and eventually he does. The sultan turns down his, his uh, offer. He offers to get the Jewish world to help pay off the Ottomans' debt, which at this time was heavy. You know, it's considered the what was the poor man of Europe because the Ottomans had had a lot of problems financially. And, and so one of the things was, well, we'll help you pay off the debt. But before this happens, he actually even gets a medal from um, from. Um, the uh, the from the Ottoman Empire from the Ottoman Empire, which even more promotes them. You know, it's not a huge deal, but getting a Jewish person getting a medal in the Ottoman Empire was a big deal. So when he starts this iconic movement, he founds a, you know a Jewish newspaper, a Zionist newspaper, and then he plans the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland. He's of course elected president. I don't think that was. And at this Congress, he, of course, um, professes a need for a Jewish homeland, but he does not care where it's going to be. As we know later, he will work with England trying to get a homeland in what is Kenya, it was called. Um, but when he meets with these people, where are these people coming from? The people who come to these comp to the Congress, the first Zionist and second Zionist Congress, are not from Europe, not the Europe he wants. They're coming from Eastern Europe and Russia. And say so they are not Orthodox or religious, but they all grew up with the same viewpoint, which was next year in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And so even though he really wasn't set at first on creating this homeland in, in what would become Israel, that's where he ended up going. Uh, you know, he would appeal to the Rothschilds and to other prominent financial people, the, the Hirsches, and try and get funding um, Israel Zangwell, of course, became somebody supported. Uh, Baron Rothschild had little interest. They had tried that in the 19, in the 1880s. But he continued to fight for this cause, despite the fact that a lot of people did not support him. And so what he did is through these next couple of years, he would go and speak to the Royal British Royal commission. He spoke, of course, with uh, uh, the secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, and that where he was negotiating an idea for maybe a country in the Sinai Peninsula, which, of course, Egypt's turned down completely. 
he tried to meet with the Pope and did meet with the Pope. Did he meet with, he either met with the Pope or, or met with the Cardinal, I think the Cardinal. And, you know, basically they said, you know, you're a Catholic, we can't do this for you. You know, then there's the 1903 Kishinev pogrom in which almost 100 Jews are killed. And so he visited St. Petersburg to talk to the finance minister there to try and get support from the Russian leaders. Uh, we talked about the Kenya idea, which was called the Uganda project. He was still working on that by the Sixth Zionist Congress, just in case it might work. So he's less concerned with religious Zionism, and he is completely concerned with secular Zionism, which is... Yes, uh, Flossie. A question. Why, sure. was the first, why was the first Congress in Switzerland? Well, it was in Switzerland because obviously he wants to do it in a place where he can bring one is these elite Western and Central European leaders. And that's what he's looking for. So he has it at a very prominent place and in a prominent city to, you know, obviously he wants to start out on the right foot and that's why he do, does it there. Plus he's, he's given permission to do it. Uh, Larry. Uh, you had mentioned, um, you know, that nationalism was uh, was growing. And of course, that was one of the main reasons that World War I started, you know, this uh, severe nationalism, that this identity with the nations, you know, and the uh, Aryan superiority. But in France, could you go back for a minute to uh, the time of the um, Dreyfus trial? Uh, there must have been an undercurrent of anti-Semitism in France and possibly in other countries as well. Uh, and if that was one of the precipitating incidents, you know, it, it, uh, the Dreyfus was a trigger, let's say, you know, but there must have been, um, you know, the nationalism there um, uh, must have included anti Semitism. Well, and again, we could do a whole lesson. I can do several lessons on just the Dreyfus affair. Um, it is one of the singularly most important moments in France in the entire 19th century. Uh, we think of it in terms of the founding of the State of Israel, but in France, it had much bigger connotations internally. This one issue is so funny because Alfred Dreyfus was just a regular captain. He was a good officer by all, but that's all he was. He was a captain. You know, it's like all of this around a captain, which is obviously very prominent, but it's not like he's a major general who's running the, so, what happened in France, and again, it's very similar to what was going on in, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is, you know, Jews, France may have been more of a literate, enticing place for Jews. So this trial comes out, and of course, you've got Zola who writes about it and kind of writes, kind of breaks open the fact that the the, the the military knows that they've you know convicted somebody wrongly and they still let it go but it becomes so divisive at a time where france is on the balance on the edge of going more totalitarian and more democratic and you had people who really wanted to be make it a country with a king and a single leader and you had people who wanted to go more of the democratic route. And that became the main issue, not Dreyfus himself. It became this issue. It became so prominent that the political parties became known as the Dreyfusonians and the anti-Dreyfusonians. Though it's like that was their Republican and Democratic Party. That's how major this was. It is one of the moments that will decide which direction France goes in. Is it going to go more Russian style or more, you know, British style? Or, and obviously the Dreyfusonians win and Dreyfus eventually, but it takes years later, he is, is given back his rank, but he's in prison for 10 years. And so the anti-Semitism rises to the surfaces in ways that really provoked fear in French Jews maybe akin to today, although obviously the implications were more essential back then because it helped determine the course of France, where today it's anti-Semitism, but 
It's anti-Semitism, which is the focus. The anti-Semitism in France is not going to determine the course of, of French politics. Uh, Lou, did you have a question? No, no, no. So we could do a whole thing because it's really interesting to talk about the Dreyfus affair and the nuances, the implications, the people who got involved. It's kind of like Watergate as well. The issue was big, but the cover-up is even bigger. And so people thought he was guilty. People thought he was innocent. People thought they kind of like today that the, the press was making up. The government had not done anything wrong and the press is making it up. It was one of those things that became the only thing people were talking about for a few years. And again, it happened. I don't know if it, you know, just happened to happen at the end of the 19th century and would set the course for France uh, for the 20th century. Obviously, we know what direction it would eventually go. So it's a huge deal beyond anything that has to, you know, for us, again, the deal is it's, you know, the start of Zionism, uh, the, the, the prominent Zionism and leading to the creation of, of the Jewish state. But in France, it was just a big deal. And it could be very violent and very aggressive. There was a lot of violence and people were, again, usually in one. It was one of those things that you were one side or the other. You know, kind of like if you're an Eagles fan or a Dallas Cowboys fan, you know, you're once. But just like that, the, the Dreyfusonians were the good guys, just like the supporters of the Dallas Cowboys are the good guys. And the anti-Dreyfusonians were probably evil, like the Philadelphia Eagle. M Michael, I forgot, what team do you support? <laughs> you're you're still mute. Michael. The Giants. Uh, the Giants, sorry. For just like the Cowboys. Years. The Giants, You're just like the then. It's the exact same thing. The Giants versus the Cowboys. The <laughs> Cowboys are the, you know, it's kind of like the Jedi. They're the the the, the righteous, the, the people who are going to take us to the promised land, and the Giants are trying to drag us backwards. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, you know, whatever. So <laughs> this this is the this is the issue with the so it's a big it's a it's a and I mean, there's more on that. I mean, we could again, I did a two part course for the Learning Center on it or a three part. I remember three part course because it's a lot if you go into the specifics. But again, we're doing something else here. So he spends his life devoted to this idea of getting people to move to Israel, which they start to do. You have the first, what they call immigration olive or bets. Immigration olive had happened in the 1880s to get them to move there. Uh, he is not quite part of what we call the labor movement. He probably would have. He dies very young, obviously. Um, and so when, you know, when David okay. Ben-Gurion announces the foundation of the state of Israel. And he's standing there with the two flags going straight down. What giant picture is behind him? Herzl. It's a picture of Theodore Herzl. Herzl. So, you know, he is still 50 years after his death. And maybe because he died so young, he didn't become, go into the part where he ended up with divisive elements within the Zionist movement, you know, it's kind of like, um, like a little bit like Washington, George Washington left office right when the parties were starting to form. So he didn't become really connected with any party. So he really is revered by everybody. And that's what happened to Theodore Herzl. He dies so young that it's before the different strands come in. Flo Flossie. Rabbi, did he ever go to Israel, Dreyfus? He did. Oh, yeah, he did go to Israel. He spent some time there. He actually met with the, uh, I think, the sultan there. Uh, and or did he, no, he met with the emperor there with um, and he so he did. Uh, he did go there. He spent some time there. And, you know, he was a unique character. You know, he died and basically he said at, at my death, I want to have a funeral with no flowers uh, just give me a poor funeral. He's still part of this movement that of equality. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> there was a lot of people at his funeral, and a lot of people spoke. I, if you, you can't know so many famous people, and not, and you can't be so so much in the public eye that that will happen. So, what happens, uh, Larry? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, after World War I, um, the Middle East is kind of divided up and uh, to all the countries that were um, part of the, um, uh, the winning alliance, you know, England, France, uh, so forth, uh, uh, basically got um, pieces of, to, uh, as mandates. And of course, the English got Palestine. Um, and then the Balfour Declaration, you know, which was, I guess, from the United Nations, but uh, um, um, or Balfour, did 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 uh, uh, Herzl have any influence with Balfour? Is that why, um, you know, Balfour issued that declaration? And no, said- not at all. I mean, he had died long before mm-hmm. Lord Balfour became into the picture. He dies in 1904. You know, we're talking 1916, 1917, 1918 Balfour is when all this is going later. on. So he did have a relationship with Chamberlain. So that may have had an effect later on, but really... Two more. That was more World War II, Chamberlain and... Um, no, no, that different Chamberlain. Not that Chamberlain. Just jo- Joseph oh. Chamberlain. Oh, okay. Um, uh, he was the, the Secretary General or whatever his position was for the British government. Um, uh, maybe Colonial Secretary. I think that's what he was in charge of. That's why he went to him because he was responsible for the colonies. But no, he, he but he did set a precedent for Zionist leaders meeting with officials. You know, he met with the high cardinal, he met with the emperor, he met with the sultan. So he met with, you know, Zangwell and Chamberlain. You know, he knew Pinsker. I mean, he, 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 he petitioned the Rothschilds. So he was really, you know, he met with the, the Hirsches. So he's really because he's basically German elite himself, but not like the high elite, he was from a prosperous family, he had these connections. And that continued on because really the gauntlet in many ways would be presented to Chaim Weizmann, who obviously comes in the picture years later uh, in terms of his prominence. And he's the one who will meet with Lord Balfour and get this going. So really Herzl start, I mean, really he starts this in, you know, we're talking 1896-ish. Uh, he dies in 1904. So it's not a long period of time to start something. But it's basically impressive because he dedicated his life to it. So once he, he went into it, it's like 24 hours a day. You know, he had a, a tenuous relationship with his wife because he was always out of town. Um, you know, unfortunately, his family life is beyond tragic. Everybody dies young for some terrible reason. Um, you know, his wife dies young. His one child dies young. And then another child commits suicide because of it. There's a lot of disease. There's depression. He ends up with one grandkid who eventually does turn around, become a Zionist. When he finds out that his father is so famous, he kind of becomes a Zionist. But then he ends up committing suicide. Um, so there's no, no, there's no body left from his family, you know, drug addiction. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it, you know, one, one converts out of Jude, out of Christianity and that's why he becomes depressed and then kills himself. So it's like just terrible things. And obviously he died very young because of, of a weak heart. And so, it, it, you know, I, it's 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 traumatic. But when you dedicate your life to a cause, you may you know he leaves his family behind a little bit. Where was he buried, Rabbi? Oh, good question. So he was buried in um, first in I think Vienna, and his wish was when there's a Jewish state that his remains would be uh, disinterred and reinterred in. Israel, which is exactly what happened. So shortly after the state of Israel is declared, his remains are moved to what is, of course, Mount Herzl, which if you go to Israel, it is the top of the mountain, the top of the place where the national cemetery is. And he's at the very top. He has his own set space, which really nobody else has it like that. So again, it's because of of he's so revered. And again, a lot of it is because He died before the political parties came into, you know, there was this debate. And so, and his funeral in Vienna was huge. I mean, he wanted a private little funeral, but there was probably several thousand people came to his funeral. So by the time he died, he had become taken this 
idea, which was around, I mean, Zionism had been around and, and underneath and small corners, but nobody really took it seriously. And then you get a prominent statesman writer from a good family from, you know, Budapest, and he creates this, this movement. Now, how do you know it's a movement? Because not because of the supporters, but because of the detractors. When so many people speak against something, you know it must be doing something. You know, when the Orthodox are coming out and saying, no, we're not doing this, and they talk about it, it means it's making an impact. When the assimilated, not only assimilated, acculturated Jews in Europe and America are saying, no, we're not doing that. We are happy living here. We need to integrate but just the mere fact that they're speaking about it so much shows how the movement has gained traction. And that's what happened. And by his death, they'd already had this. As again, whenever you say Aliyah, it means moving to Israel. When they ever say Aliyah, Aliyah, like the first Aliyah is the one in the 1880s. That's the one that didn't take. But Aliyah Bet, which is the second one, which really is the beginning of the formation, is during his lifetime. Now, again, there are already Jews living in this area. There have always been Jews living here. So it's not the first Jews. It's just more. Michael. Uh, yeah. And did Herzl have any influence in the uh, establishment of Tel Aviv? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, it is mostly because of him that it was established. So he has a lot of influence in the Tel Aviv. It just basically means it's like Tel is like, Tell means like uh, like an old city, like, you know, tell anytime you see like tell, it means this is where a city used to be and it's old and, and it's old, it's not there anymore. So Tel Aviv just means that plus spring. And so he's one of the people who got that founded, actually. So uh, that would be the not the first, you know, Petatikva is kind of the first city area, but Tel Aviv would be the first major city. Um, Larry. So after he dies in 1904, he still, at that time, he was president, still president of the Zionist Congress. Yeah, was he was still a, president. So who was the prime mover then? I, I mean, you say there was a lot of, um, you know, interest and because it was, um, you know, opposed, uh, which brought it to the headlines. But was there a prominent second in command that um, what? of the Zionist <clears throat> movement? Well, what happens next is, of course, who is going to take over? And this is where you get into the movements, you know, and the movement that really takes off right away is labor Zionism. You know, it's the creation of working oh, the, the land. Oh, 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 well, Although, I one more time. Would you say that again, Larry? I lost you for a second there. Oh, oh, well. H-A-P-O-E-L, I think, was the labor movement. Oh, yeah, the, the old, yeah, Hapoel, yeah, the labor movement. So, um, yeah, so that takes over. So the main two people are going to take over the leadership. So are going to be Chaim Weitzman, who takes it over. He's kind of the heir apparent for Theodor Herzl. He is the intelligent Western European from a good family scientist who will be very prominent. And in Israel, of course, it'll be David Ben-Gurion, who is going to be the leader of the labor movement. And those would be the two that really continue the ball rolling and take it to the next level. Um, and I was just double checking on the Tel Aviv was founded in 1909. So so he was not alive during it, but he was integral in trying to get uh, this founded. Um, just to let you know, I didn't think he'd live to see it. Yeah, I just wanted to double check. Uh, Lou. All right, this is probably stupid as usual, but not no, not at all. Not not somebody with your computer hacking skills could never. <laughs> I know he was looking at other lands. What how the world would be different if he had set up shop in Kenya or someplace so not in the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, again, you'd think so, but you know, think about the 1960s in Kenya when they rebel in Uganda and Kenya against their British overlords. What would have the Jews done? You know, it's 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 you're right. Who knows what would happen? They may have helped Kenya became a become a prominent, more prominent uh, technological country. You're right. I mean, he would have taken anywhere. I mean, there was even talks of South America. I mean, he he was not 
an ardent supporter of any particular area at first. Uh, mm -hmm. Flossie. When did the Orthodox Jews turn around about Israel and become? That's a great question. Still have it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's another part right there. <laughs> so, what happened? Now, again, the ultra-Orthodox we see today that are like that is not what it was back then. That is a new relative, this ultra-Orthodox who do not believe in science and all this. That's a, that's a whole new level. What happened, and this is somebody else we can talk about, is as this became more prominent, certain Orthodox Jews started to be supportive. And there were also Orthodox Jews in Israel. So obviously you couldn't be overtly supportive until a very prominent rabbi who would become the first chief rabbi of Israel, obviously before, before it became a country in the 1920s. The name was Rob Cook, and he's another person we can talk about. He really was not the founder, but the main leader for religious Zionism. And what he said was basically... He agreed you cannot start a country until the Messiah comes. However, the labor Zionists, the, the secular Zionists are working for God and for the Messiah. So the Messiah is just not kind of going to do it. The Messiah needs these people to set it up first so the Messiah can come. And that's the excuse they needed for the now there are orthodox jews in israel who are very zionist the, in israel basically have the, they, they're divided two groups the ultra orthodox are the ones that you think about the black hats who don't work don't serve in the military and the modern orthodox and those are the the uh, adherents of this religious zionist they are fervently zionist they're the ones who do not want to give back they move to the west bank they don't want to give the west bank back um, they serve in the military. They serve in all the elite units that really started in the 1970s. And so Rav Cook really changed that movement. This ultra orthodox, don't believe in science, not really supportive of the country. That's a relatively new thing that has come up in the last 30 or 40 years. If they've been more insulated and they've tried to protect themselves and, and, and take over the country that way. Yes, Rabbi, uh, Larry. I just wanted to mention that coincidentally, uh, this Sunday, I'll be doing a film for Temple Osa Shalom. The film's called 1945, which is just at the end of World War II. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's, an, award, seen it. it's an award winning film, and it takes place uh, just after World War II, where uh, two Orthodox Jewish men return to their hometown in. Um, um, in, in Hungary. So I did a little research on Hungarian Judaism, which is very fascinating. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the mayor in the 1920s uh, of Hungary, Hungary became very um, uh, um, anti-Jewish with anti-Jewish laws and things of that nature. But the mayor of, uh, uh, of uh, Vienna actually called Budapest, Judapest. And yeah. um, I think Germany, not Germany, but um, Hungary had like 5% Jews, of which about 25% were in Hungary. And uh, the proportion, if you look at it, of the Jews that were involved in politics and industry, um, I think something like 4,000 factories at the time of a survey that I looked at, uh, about 39% uh, of them were owned and operated by Jews. So uh, there were tremendous undercurrents of uh, Judaism, um, you know, in, uh, in Hungary, particularly in Budapest. Budapest. The Jews there were really separated into the Jews of Budapest, who were, as you say, you know, very intellectual and uh, uh, very much of the um, um, assimilation style compared to the Jews of the suburbs out there. If you go to all the suburbs of the shtetls, um, and um, it's it's just quite a fascinating story as far as uh, the history. Yeah, of that Jews. sounds like a great movie. When was that movie? Uh, when did it come out? It was made in 2017, and it's been also uh, recent. It's pretty recent, yeah, but it's uh, it's it, it's it's recent, but it's yet current about trying to return home and the guilt of the people who were had taken the Jewish properties at the time and uh, their guilt and uh, um, it, it's a marvelous film. We're showing it at one o'clock at the um, uh, where Temple Osa Shalom has. I'm sure everybody can come and they're invited whether they're yeah. Is there any that. cost to this? I'm sorry, say no cost. All right, good. It's, yeah, I'm just restarting. So everybody. So that would, what time again? It's Sunday at 
one o'clock in the um, Presbyterian Church in Bluffton. It's at the Fellowship. Oh, yeah. So I'm restarting well, the. Like... Yeah. So are you going to do a discussion as well, Larry? Afterwards. I hope to. Yeah. Yeah. I hope to do okay. a discussion afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interesting idea about how do you return home, and um, who's guilty, and um, you know, with today's immigration, and uh, you know, uh, particularly in Gaza, I think it, it draws a lot of uh, a lot of conversation. Yeah, and I, I, that sounds great. So everybody, if you have an opportunity, thank, thank you, Larry. Please publicize all these things and let us know. So yeah, Dr. Magazine this month also has a very interesting article on the um, um, the uh, Israeli national anthem of how that came. Oh, really? Out. Yeah. So if you want to read that, that the whole issue, the whole article is based the whole the whole issue is based on. Uh, you know, how to support Israel. And uh, it goes into uh, even Jewish cooking, you know, to support Israel and uh, all kinds of things that you wouldn't think of, of ways of supporting them. So it's, it's a good magazine. We just got it yesterday. Okay, I'll look at it because my wife gets it as well. All right. Thank you, guys. And one more thing about Herzl is he was also the person who, I forgot to mention, he encouraged these Jewish wealthy Jews to buy land in what is now Israel. And one of the reasons Israel, when they originally did the partition plan that Israel got the section they did is because Jews had bought so much land in those areas. So when you see how Israel, they bought it a lot on the coast and towards the north and more inland in the north. And so when you see, we can do another thing, when you see the land that Jews would buy and then you see the, uh, the partition plan for 1947 and the UN, you'll see that's why that was it. So he really wanted to create this idea that we're buying the land and so we own it. So, all right. So also a, Herzl, Herzl well, Leah, by the way, is named after him. That might be an interesting topic for next week if you want to talk about the Jewish National Fund. Well, we, I mean, let's we'll talk about we were going to do we're going to do individuals. We can do the JNF. Or what, what do you guys want to do for next week? We're doing individuals on, on that means, list. Land purchase. And there's a lot of controversy over some of the land purchases that they used to, for the Jewish National Fund. How they yeah. were established and what yeah. the goals are. doesn't have to be next week, but, if, you know, maybe in the future. The Rabbi, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned this Rob Cook. I've never heard of him. Is he interesting? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so he could be somebody, Michael. Definitely yeah. is. I, I just wanted to, to mention that one reason I think I came in late was because I was using the. Uh, yeah, we had the, a little problem. I'm going to fix it. I'll send out a new link. What happened okay, was. That's, I was going to say, send out a new link. Somehow because Zoom, the one you used last week seemed to work, but the one that we've been using. The Zoom, didn't, Zoom didn't. erased all of the links for this class going all the way back okay so it's gone it's not you know usually it has the previous thing where you'll see the classes it's all gone i don't know what happened i didn't find this out so i came to the computer uh we did set up a separate line on our zoom account and maybe under that separate line i don't have access to that yet i just don't have the password so i gotta get all that and so i'll okay. check that i'll send out a new link though for next week thank you so we're gonna thank do you. do we want uh, flossy i think it was a great idea do you want to do flossy She's not here. Oh, yeah, did I cook. say something wrong? Good idea, cook. Yeah. Did yeah. I say something wrong? No. <laughs> no I washed my cup. My cup. What we could do is Rob Cook and some of the other Zionist point. leaders. Uh, we could do Rob Cook and Zionist leaders like Ahad Am and some of the ones that led these different, you know, uh, David Ben Gurion and uh, Chaim we we uh, White Weitzman. And talk That's about the right. different yeah. Zionisms. Why don't we do that? We'll talk about the different Zionisms that would develop after Herzl's death, especially. That would be interesting. It would be a follow-up. That would. Be yeah. Nice. So we'll do that. Okay. I'm just going to put this. Uh, Michael likes the idea. We could do it. So. Cook. Well, then you must do it. If I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so right we'll look you? at probably Ben Gurion. Weitzman, Cook, and maybe a Chada Am. You're going to send out a new link, is that right? 
I am going to sit down and I got to figure out what's wrong with this thing. Or more aptly, I've got to tell Jason to figure out what's wrong with this. <laughs> so I didn't find out. He was right here, but I didn't want him to come in and start fixing everything while we started after we started the class. So happy new year again, everybody. Next week, we'll talk about some of the various Zionisms, including religious Zionism, labor Zionism, uh, political Zionism, and more uh, social Zionism. Rabbi, one other thing. Saturday, I understand you're having an interesting speaker who's going to be talking about Savannah during the summer. Oh, yeah. Life. Thanks for reminding about all the things that are coming up. Uh, we have a special, we're going to do a new type of musical service this Friday night with musical instruments. Saturday, we have the uh, Harriet Meyerhoff is going to speak a little bit during services and then in the social. And she's going to, we, we talk so much about the, um, you know, the Northern Jews who came down and, and worked with the, the, um, the, the civil rights, but what were Jews doing? You know, what was it like to live in the South during civil rights and yeah. during uh, the periods before it? So she's going to speak about what it was like to grow up in Savannah during the fifties and sixties. Oh, yeah. And we'll do this for Martin Luther King week. And also on Monday, we are going to be marching as a community in the MLK day parade. Uh, you can sign up. It's you can, if you don't feel like you can walk that far, there's a bus for us. So people can just drive the bus loop. Are they closing MLK Drive on Saturday? No, they should not be. Not as far as we know, but it will be on on Monday. Okay. If I hope not. <laughs> I don't think so, though. And then we've got, of course, the Scholar Residence coming up. We're going to have a special legislative Shabbat uh, in two weeks. We're going to invite judges and legislators from the area along in connection with the AJC to talk about Jews and anti-Semitism in Israel. Uh, the annual meeting will be on the 28th on Sunday. We'll have a uh, nosh at 2.30, the annual meeting at 3, and then at 4.30 afterwards, we're going to have a concert to raise money for Israel. It'll be a 30-minute con 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 concert by, uh, uh, by Ben uh, Warsaw, so that should be really nice, and there will be just donations. All donations will go to the uh, Federation. So Got lots of stuff going on. We got classes coming up. For those of you who are planning, come tonight. Uh, that has been postponed. Uh, Rachel, our cantor, is sick, so they won't have the card-making thing tonight, but they'll do it another day. All right, guys. Have a Thank good you. one. Great to see okay. you on this computer. Great to talk with you on another computer. Yeah. And I hope everybody has a wonderful week, and I'll see you guys hopefully Friday and Saturday. Yeah, one sec. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Bye-bye. Bye yeah. yeah, one. Are you okay? Yeah, one sec. Um, oh, it finally turned off. Okay, I was listening to the end of the rabbi's class. Okay, it's over. Okay, so this means you said, do you have small plates? Small plates? Yeah, uh, I've got plenty of paper plates. Good. If you could bring me small paper plates, that'd be great. Small. These aren't very good. I'm just going to give you the link. These aren't very good. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Anything else? 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 Anything or the fifth or something for about eight or nine days. So it, we had a storm here yesterday and there wasn't anything to do. Well, I'm busy the whole day. I didn't have anything to check. I'm not sure if it's a test or a test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.
memorial service this afternoon at the chapel. You know, um, I told you that when he talked to me and they got into this stupid card making class. And um, uh, they want to make cards for, you know, people that are sick or something. I'm going, you might be here, got to be kidding. I'm not doing that. You can get to our. <laughs> so, um, anyway, can't get Rachel sick. So, the card making got canceled, but so we still got a memorial service. And her name is Gail Sundale, Kathleen Snell. Um, her son died uh, in November, I think. She's just now having the memorial service. I didn't know the son, but I know Gail not all that well, but just to support her. She's a nice, nice little lady. And, um, yeah. Did he die? He was sick. I mean, when we were. When we were working on food festival, she had told me her son was sick, and I don't know. Um, I don't know what was wrong with him. And when Jonathan was in, and we were at services, we ended up sitting with her and her other son and daughter-in-law that live in Bluffton. He, he, and the daughter-in-law were just lovely. And um, uh, but anyway, so I mean, I don't know Dale that well. I guess she's nice, but. Uh, so anyway, that was about it. Anything new? Yeah. You in the car? No, I'm walking. Oh, okay. You're going for an early morning walk? Uh, yeah, I just walked to the grocery store and all this time. Oh, okay. okay. So what are your hours now? Well, there's still there's six to two thirty. Oh, which you know I could do seven to three thirty. I started it. I started doing a six o'clock start time so that I had time at the end of the day for overtime. Uh -huh. Um. And then I guess for the past week and a half, I've just been keeping it. You know, it's hard, hard to get out of bed at 5.30, um, but it's nice to be done at 2.30. Right. So, I don't know. I think I'm going to keep it this way. Okay. Okay. Did you make an appointment with your boss? No, she doesn't know. She comes back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'll be out there this morning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, Jonathan, yesterday, he did not answer. He had to phone it back. You know, I, he usually calls me every day, and I haven't heard from him for a couple of days. And I went to sleep early last night. I went to sleep at like 9 30. But sometimes he'll call me at 10, 10 30, sometimes 11. So I just texted him and said I'm going to sleep so he couldn't call and wake me up. Um, yeah. Uh, so I haven't talked to him for a couple of days either, which is a little unusual because he's, you know, he does call me almost every day. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I did. I wanted to give myself a little bit of time to calm down. And then I felt like I was ready to talk to him yesterday, but it didn't make that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll talk to him tonight. Um, yeah, I'll talk to him later, like I said. I'm just making some very silly decisions lately. <laughs> You know, staying in Costa Rica that extra day, dating a married woman. Like, Did you tell me that she's happily married? Yes. What did you say? I mean, I, I don't remember what we said to each other, but why was she even online looking if she's so happily married? And you asked me if they have a looking marriage. I mean, I don't know.
Um, you going out with somebody this week? Thank you, Thank you. Um, yeah, tonight I think haven't heard of him. And then uh, tomorrow I have this red challenge. And I don't need to bring you the new ones. I actually need to know what it's to pay back. You know, right. So I uh, well, to me, what you know, you're talking really over my pay grade. Rosh Hodesh is like the beginning of the month, isn't it? That's what I think of when I think of Rosh Hodesh. It's the first day of the month. Yeah. So is there a celebration the first day of the month? I don't know. It's like I mean it's like dinner and there's a program that I have to pay for. And is it that temple? No, I put this one in half. Oh. And and so it costs eighteen dollars. Yeah. Is it so? 